All right, so Romans chapter 9. I'll tell you what, I'm going to just start reading to you. <coughs> Are we having technical difficulties? No? Okay. All right, so here we go. Let's go ahead and start. I'm going to just read. Let me just read the first three verses while she's getting it up there. Okay, there we go. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continue, continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that, that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So I decided to go ahead and just stick with, um, with Romans, and we'll see how far we get with all of this. I did ask, y'all be lift, uh, keeping brother... Pastor Kirk and Sister Brenda lifted up. They went to Dallas. They've been doing ministry over there. He, he's been keeping me up to date. We may have to change this TV out, just saying, like we got that other TV back there because this thing's acting up, but we're going to definitely need some men one day maybe to do that. I don't know if anybody can, is up for that, but that other TV back there is, is working. This one's giving us trouble, so it needs, to be, it needs to be done at some point. Amen? All right. Um, so Pastor Kirk and Sister Brenda been over there in Dallas, and he's been kind of keeping up with me, um, letting me know what's going on. They definitely doing they doing ministry over there. So y'all just keep them lifted up, Amen. And uh, when he gets back, I think I'm going to get him to try to do like a little series on the gifts of the Spirit, do a little teaching uh, whenever they get back on Wednesday nights. But uh, anyway, so y'all, I just was thinking about them because he called me yesterday. So. In these first three verses, Paul voices his concern about the spiritual condition of his brethren. He would call, he would call the Israelites his brothers. You know, it'd be kind of like you and I being concerned about the spiritual condition of America. You know, we're Americans. It's, it's a lot different than that because they were born Israelites. They were born, it was, it was their nat- national heritage. It was, uh, it was, you know, they were... They were the country that God had birthed, but, but more importantly than just being a people group from a certain nation, they actually were, um, you know, they were the people that God had chosen. God had chosen Israel out of all the other nations, amen, and uh, so, so Paul is concerned about it, and that's whenever he uses some pretty heavy-duty language whenever he says that he wishes that he himself could be accursed from the Christ. And, you know, we've learned about that. Is that, is that little thing kind of bothering y'all a little bit? It's aggravating? You can turn it off. Sorry, Ailey. You had the right idea. All right. So, um, so well, y'all just have to look over here and over here. So, um, you know, he's saying that he wished he could be a curse from the Christ. And if you'll remember the word Christ means Messiah, amen. And God had promised that he was going to send the, uh, the Christ to the world. And he announced it through the nation of Israel. And so um, I just want, uh, before we move forward to the next verse, I wanted to just try to get you to imagine in your mind a world in the ancient days whenever really and truly humanity doesn't know about God. Okay, just think about that. Darkened, the darkened ages. You know, we don't really know exactly what went on pre-flood, but we know according to the Bible and even extra biblical information that it was bad. It was, it was, really, it was really sick. It was wicked. There was a lot of wickedness and perverseness in the land, right? And so with, with all of that said, the, 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 the people were darkened. And so even after the flood, we get the idea that there are individuals here and there. The Job is one of them. He, that's the oldest book written, uh, known to man in the Bible. Um, and so Job would have been a believer of God. And, and then, you know, we hear of Seth's lineage and, and the people that come from there. So there were individuals that knew God, but then we have this big situation that takes place at the Tower of Babel. And I know we've been talking about it a lot, but I want us to keep our minds focused on the concept of God's kingdom. And so a big thing happens at the Tower of Babel where the people that are that have multiplied after the flood have rebelled against God and and that they have instead chosen to worship false gods. That's essentially, even though we don't see a lot of that detailed information, that's what's going on at Babel. And so God, uh, you know, real quickly, uh, basically he disinherits the nations and he allows them to be brought under the leadership. We get this out of Daniel 
the prince of Persia and the prince of Grecia and Michael being the prince of Israel, that God allowed the nations to be brought under the influence of, you could say it, the sons of God are fallen angels. And so we see that the nations are against God and they're rebelling against God and humanity is rebelling against God. So I want you to imagine a world that's full of that type of darkness where very few individuals really know about God. And then even like as God would reveal himself to man, mankind, then what ends up happening is, is that as, as mankind is being revealed to the enemy, it does such a good job at what he does is trying to erase the evidence of God, right? And so, but in the plan of God, what he did was he created this nation, Israel, through this one man, Abraham, and through this one man, he gave the world the Messiah or the Christ. And that's what, he, that's what the Apostle Paul says in verse 4. If you could go to verse 4 real quick, it says, who are Israelites, talking about his brethren. He says, who are, the, who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises. And so what I want you to think about with regards to this is that God, again, is introducing himself to mankind or making himself known to the human race. And the way that he has chosen to do that is he cre after he divides up all these other nations, if you turn the page from chapter 10 and 11 to chapter 12, he calls Abraham, okay? And so through Abraham, he promises to make a great nation, right? And so through this one particular nation, God begins to show the heathen nations around him. And when we say heathen nations, we got to understand that life, it wasn't then like it is now. Meaning most people in nations around the world know about Jesus. They've heard about the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, they got, you got the news, you've got missionaries, in America, even though we have people that choose not to serve Jesus, they know about him. They've, you know, Bible, we're allowed to have Bibles. We're allowed to talk about the gospel. But there was a dark time for mankind whenever they didn't know about the God of Israel. God created a nation so that he could reveal himself to them and that through them, he could reveal himself to the world that was going to be around them, right? And so whenever you think about the first, you know, the adoption and the glory, if you just think about some of those words right there, and we'll talk about the adoption here in a moment, but glory has to do with God's presence, the glory cloud. And that they call that the Shekinah glory. That was, that was in the, ta the tabernacle. God's presence would sit upon and then it would envelop the inside of the tabernacle to the point where, you remember, Moses' light face would become all lit up and he would have to wear a veil because Paul tells us, us that the glory was beginning to fade. And so the glory of God, representative of the presence of God, what that tells us is that God's people Israel were the people on earth that his presence was with them. Amen? And so that's an important thing. You know, if you remember in the Old Testament, whenever they were in the wilderness, God said that his, that his glory would, you know, was a cloud by day and, and fire by night, and that whenever he would move, they were to move. And so the, the glory cloud, if you will, represented the presence of God with his people. Good news for New Testament Christians, the presence of God lives on the inside of you because you become the tabernacle of God and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you and everywhere that you go, God goes with you. Amen. So that was just one aspect, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law and the promises that God gave to the nation of Israel, whether it has to do with end time events and the end kingdom and all of those things were given to Israel for the purpose to prepare prepare mankind. You know, whenever I talked about it a while back, about how the law was given to almost serve as a nanny or a tutor to bring mankind through them, 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 through or as a servant to help mankind through the stages of salvation history. During that stage, 
it was Israel was on the stage, was on the, the focal point of God, and God gave them the law to, pre, to bring them through to the next stage and to prepare mankind for the next stage, which was the giving of Jesus as the promised Messiah that God had revealed to Israel for all those thousands of years through the prophets, through the kings, and to prepare them that Jesus was coming. Everything that God did in the Old Testament, a lot of times, in other churches, people have a hard time seeing that, that God was revealing Jesus even in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system, through the, the candlestick or the menorah, which is the light. Jesus was the light given from God, and Jesus tells you and I that, that we are the light of the world because his light is transferred to us, and now we illuminate, it. we bring glory and illuminate him, and that's God's plan, you know, and we could go on and on, but, but the point is, is that God God uh, gave, created this nation and gave them the truth of his work. Amen. And so when it, goes, when it comes to this word adoption, I just wanted to kind of focus on that for a second because <laughs> the word in the, in the Greek uh, is uh, neo, neothesia, okay, which means son position or son appointed. So God appointed Israel as his son. Out of all the other nations or people groups on the earth, after he divided the nations according to languages, God didn't choose Syria, God didn't choose Guatemala, God didn't choose Holland, God chose Israel and, and positioned them as his son. Amen? And so the, the beauty about a son, though, in the Old Testament um, and in biblical times is that the son... All sons were able to receive some type of, a, of an inheritance. But the firstborn, and I want to I point that out too because Romans 9 starts to talk about that a little bit. The firstborn had the birthright. And the birthright was interconnected to a double portioned blessing. But it also meant that for the firstborn, he was given the authority of his father over the family. Okay, so he would take the authority from his father and he would provide, you know, whatever needed judicially or economically for the family. It was his responsibility. Okay, and we see that ultimately through Jesus being the firstborn, he fulfills that role as priest and to do the work of his father. And so, just real quick, when we understand Old Testament Israel, it's important that we understand that the birthright was a big thing. That they were to respect the birthright because they understood that there was a great blessing. And also the people of Israel, as the days went forward and the years passed by, understood that it was through them that the world was going to be blessed with Messiah. Now, Israel got very confused through the years, and especially during the time frame when Jesus shows up, they're very self-righteous, and they're very concerned about their own selves, right? And that um, in the midst of all of that, with, with their own concern, they, they begin to forget that God in the Old Testament through various prophets also said that he was going to reach out to the Gentiles. And we'll see that in this passage of Scripture. And so they were very focused on themselves, right? So, But God wanted his people to be focused on him. And he wanted, he, he, that's why every woman, you all have heard me talk about this before, it was a big deal to be able to have a child, and especially to have a male child, because they expected that Messiah was going to come. They didn't necessarily know exactly what Messiah was going to all entail. Like many times, they, by the time Jesus shows up, they think, oh, he's just the king that's going to deliver us from Rome. Because they knew Messiah would come from David. Okay, um, but yet at the same time, David had said in Psalm 22 that he would be pierced. Isaiah said in, Psalm, in, in Isaiah 53 that he would bear he would bear our burdens. He would be chastised for us. That, you know, he, he, there was no beauty that we would desire him and that, and that he, he would pay the price for all of our iniquities. And so they were pre-warned and prepared, if you will, in the Old Testament through the prophets that he was coming and what his purpose was going to be. But it seems as though they never put two and two together to understand, you know, that, that Jesus was going to be the Messiah and they end up rejecting him in the end whenever all of that is said and done. But so that's why Paul is saying, I would rather be accursed for my own brethren 
because he understands that his brethren or his, this people group, Israel, that, that they have rejected Messiah at this point in human history, 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 in revelation by this point that what Jesus did at the cross doesn't just save you, but and that, so he's also put together that he's our Passover lamb. He's, you know, he's made all these connections, and in his own personal life, he's come to the, tr the realization that what Jesus did at the cross will also set you free from the bondage of sin. In addition to that, also your relationship with Jesus brings you out from under the dominion of the law and you no longer have to live under the dominion of the law and that instead there's great grace and mercy available to the people of God. And, he, and he's concerned about his, his brethren in the flesh, he would call them, because they've, they've rejected and that they don't know. Now, listen, you got to understand the first church, the first converts were Jews. Right, And many Jews were converted then, and many Jews are being converted now. But we got to understand that, that if a Jew has not received Christ today, he's no different than a pagan. Yeah. Yeah. He's no different than a pagan in God's eyes. In God's eyes, the Jewish people as a nation have rejected Jesus. Now, that'll, that'll make some people want to throw dust in the air. Because they, probably some of y'all, you, maybe your grandma or somebody you know, is giving money over there to bring the Jews back from Europe over there to Israel. And I just, I'm sorry, I just don't see where that's beneficial. Now, if you're going to pay a preacher to minister to Jews, make sure he's a preacher that's reaching them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they must be saved. Paul taught us that in the book of Ephesians. That he took two people and he made them one. Amen? And so the Jews have to come in the same way. They have to come in through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But at that point, they had rejected, and that's what Paul, his concern is regarding the people. You can go ahead and go to verse 5. And so he goes on to say that. He says, whose are the fathers? Because he, he was just talking about Israel, and he was talking about the covenant, the adoption, right? We talked about adoption means a son that's been appointed or been positioned. Amen? And, and, and then he goes on to say this, Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever, amen. And so <laughs> when he says that, he's connecting it back to the promises. And he's saying the promises belong to the fathers. And you know, you know who the fathers are, just in case some of you may know. You might want to shout something out while you're here. Like a little Bible study. You want to give me a little word. What you, who do you think the fathers are? Huh? Lift it again. Thank you. That's exactly who it is. The patriarchal fathers. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, the ancient of days. Hallelujah. And so the, those, to them, to Israel, belongs the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh, meaning physical birth, the Christ who came and who is over all. Amen? So, again, I actually had it in my notes, but Brendan told us for us, so I don't have to repeat it again. Well, let me just say it one more time. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchal fathers. Because, you see, that's the first ones that God gave the promise to. Again, I want you to remind yourself of a world that is void of understanding God, other than a few individuals here and there. You and I sit back in the luxury to not just know God, but to know God at a deeper level, to know God and even the intricate works of how the gospel works, because we've been sitting in this church for God knows how long, some of us for quite some time, and you know, and we've been, I hate to say it, but I think sometimes we might be spoiled. You may not agree with that, but, uh, but our access to the gospel, um, we, 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 sometimes I think we're spoiled, you know? And, um, and, and, and so anyway, that's just another story for another time, but uh, I know that I'm grateful to, to be, have, have been exposed to the truth of this word, amen? So in Romans chapter 6 and, and 7, it says, Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are Israel. Look at that. Isn't that something right there? They are not all Israel which is Israel. I'm over here height lighting my text thinking y'all can see it. 
For they are not all Israel which are Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But look at this. In Isaac shall your seed be called. One time I was witnessing, and I've shared this before to a, to a Muslim man. I had already witnessed to his wife, and he was in the clinic, and I was talking to him about, you know, I first I found out that, that, their, that their people, like, um, harvest olives on the Mount of Olives. So that's how the story starts. And, it, you know, it's amazing, though, when I talk to the, a lot of these people, everybody harvests olives on the Mount of Olives. But anyway, at least that's what it seems like. And so as I'm talking to this fella, I asked him, I said, well, wait, do y'all read the Old Testament? Do y'all read the, the Torah? And they claim they do. I don't know. I've never read the Koran. I don't really care to endeavor to do that. Um, but, but he said that he claimed that they do, that, they, that they, part of their scriptures contain the, the Old Testament scriptures, but, then they, but they don't seem to know a whole lot about that. I would really like to meet a Muslim one day that knows a lot so that I could really but I haven't met that person yet. I know that they're out there, but I haven't met them yet. But anyway, he says, and, and so I said, well, did, did you not read in the book of Genesis that right here, God said, Isaac will be the seed, not Ishmael. And so that poses a problem. Now, I don't know if they did a little switcheroo and put the name Ishmael there instead of Isaac, and then that takes all the confusion out, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses changed the word worship to obeisance in, in Hebrews, I think it's chapter 1, verse 5, to take away the deity of Christ because we know that you can't worship an angel and they believe that, you know, he's an angel, all this kind of stuff. So it, that would be a quick switcheroo that would make things easy, but, but this is what the Scripture says. The Scripture says this, that it's not that the word of God is taken into effect, but listen, you need to, they need to understand not all of Israel that calls itself Israel is Israel. Amen. And can I just say this? Not all that calls itself Christian is Christian. And I'm not, listen, I ain't this, I ain't the, I'm not the Holy Spirit. Let me use proper grammar. I'm not the Holy Spirit. It's not my job to judge who's in and who's out. I just know this, that when you're in, Amen. Uh, then the, in the whole, in the Holy Spirit lives in you. Then you're saved. Amen. But I do know that there's a work on the earth to bring false doctrine and to bring lies uh, to confuse people. And many people that believe that they could be saved, or, or do they even think that they're saved? Because in many churches in America today. Um, you know, somebody texted me just the other day. What about the preachers that aren't even preaching on sin? You know, and, don't, and never even mention that whenever you get ready to get that you're going to get saved, that you have to also repent of your sin. You know, and, and so there's a false doctrine out there. There's false teaching out there. And the concerns that I have is that maybe many people aren't even really saved. Right. And so they call we call them the church. But are they really the church? And again, it's not my job to decide who's in or who's out, but th that's a problem that we're facing in America. And you and I need to understand that. That there's a, that, you know, this whole seeker sensitive movement, and you know, you already probably know about that, but, but not everybody that calls itself Christian is Christian. Just like not everybody, and this is an interesting little, little shift of gears that Paul's pulling on us right here. Not everybody that calls itself Israel is Israel, right? And what he's talking about is that he's talking about a true Israelite. Initially, when Paul's talking about this, the argument surrounds the thought of physical versus a spiritual birth. Because, he, he, again, and, and I got some scriptures that, that we'll kind of go into, but, you know, he says, he says, in Isaac shall your seed be called. But so while it starts off as a physical versus a spiritual birth thing, that's what Paul's talking about. Before it's over with, it transitions to faith versus flesh. Okay? Look at, look at John chapter 8. Can you turn with me up there on the screen or in your Bibles to John chapter 8 verse 39? Because I want to talk to you about, about Abraham and about what it means to be a child of Abraham or what it means to be a true Israelite, at least from the perspective of what Paul is talking about. See, Paul's not talking about, he, he's not even talking to, you know, somebody might have showed up in the crowd. It, I don't think it happened. Hey, I was born, I'm a Jew. But that's not really what he's talking about. The question is, are you born again as a believer? That's what he's really talking about. And so they answered, some of the Jews that were around Jesus, they answered and said unto him, talking about Jesus, they said to Jesus, Abraham is our father. Jesus says unto them, if you were Abraham's children, 
you would do the works of Abraham. So I'll put in my, in my notes, what is the work of Abraham? And we, we recently went through this not long ago, but Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Romans 4, verse 3. What are the works of Abraham? It says, for what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Amen? The point that I want you to see there, if we could highlight it, I'd ask her to highlight it. Abraham believed God. So what is the work of Abraham to believe God? Amen? Um, so that was Romans chapter 4, verse 3. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Now we're going to go back to John We'll go to John chapter 6, and John 6, verse 28. We're going to, go, we're going to read 28 and 29. So John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? You see, listen, I already told you that it's a transition between is it a physical birth versus a spiritual birth? Is it flesh versus faith? Is it works versus faith? So the people of God, the, the Israelite, the, the Jews of the time during Jesus' time, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus' answer in verse 29 is this. He said unto them, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he sent. Amen? Well, I mean, isn't that a beautiful scripture? Like, what, what do I need to do to be right with, with God? Believe on him whom God sent. Yeah. It, I'm standing right, Jesus would say, I'm standing right here in front of you. There's another passage of scripture in the gospel of John where Jesus says, you, you pour through the scriptures, you search the scriptures, for in them you believe that you have eternal life. Yet these very scriptures point you to me, but you won't have me. Right, right. Amen? And so this is, the, this is the crux of what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 9. He's talking about his brethren born according to the physical birth of Israel, being an Israelite, but at the same time rejecting Messiah at the most important time of God's salvation history. God's very own people rejected the plan that he had. Amen? Amen. And so the characters, he, he's going to transition. Let's go back to Romans chapter 9. And the characters uh, that he's going to transition, he's going to talk about, uh, he, he ends up talking about Isaac. And, you know, the, 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 it doesn't say Ishmael in the text, but by him saying, in Isaac shall the seed be called, it's, it's inferring that the seed is in Isaac, not in Ishmael. It's in the spiritual belief and birth, not in the physical belief and birth, right? Because the truth is, is that Ishmael was a child of Abraham also, but, but Ishmael doesn't receive the inheritance. Does that make sense? All right, so it's not about the physical birth. This could also be described as the works of man versus faith in God. The true offspring of Abraham are those that believe in what Abraham believed. I told you all to go. You can just keep it where you are in Romans, if you're back in, you can go to Romans, back to Romans 9. But I'm just going to read to you Galatians real quick. Galatians 3, 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Are they all children, but in Isaac shall the seed be called. So not all, all right, so, so the faith of Abraham, Amen. So Abraham believed God according to God's plan. Those that believe in the plan of God are the true offspring of Abraham. Amen? Those that believe in the plan of God are the true offspring of Abraham as opposed to those who try to take matters into their own hands and trust in their own version of the life that they want in their own minds and they begin to manipulate circumstances in order to achieve their goals or desires. When we intervene in order to make God's plan happen, we in essence are producing the flesh of Ishmael. Now I took some liberty right there and I introduced a little bit of the story 
of wherever God was talking about in Isaac shall the seed be called. And then I introduced the concept of Ishmael, but I just told you the story of how Abraham tried to handle his own business and take matters into his own hands in order to accomplish what he believed to be the will of God. And so for you and I, it's important that we understand that we could have a desire to live for the Lord. We could have a desire to live, you know, to be focused on on his kingdom. But at the same time, we could attempt in our own strength and according to our own wisdom to do things our own way instead of waiting on the Lord, instead of being patient and trusting God, amen, and, and instead of praying and, and, say, and being still and knowing that he is God and hearing the voice of the Lord, we could forge forward with our own plans and make our own thing happen. And look, when we do that, then guess what? We do, we create chaos in our own life. Look, there's enough chaos on the earth as it is right? But, but you know one of the beautiful things about chaos in the life of the believer? I don't know if it's beautiful. Maybe that's not a way to say it. But one of the awesome things about it is that God doesn't waste anything. He causes all things to work together for, for good to those that love the Lord. Amen? And so even though we may have gone down the wrong path, opened up some wrong doors, and allowed some wrong things up in our heart and in our life, and chaos abounds and it causes frustration and irritation, God's not going to waste it. We just got to hold on to the Lord and continue to trust. Amen? I, I don't know if this gospel message that I'm preaching up here works for all believers. I don't know. I don't know that. But when I read the Bible, I'm just trying to tell you what I learned from the Bible. And, and, and it's, a hard, it's not always an easy thing right. because we live in a real world. And what I mean is, is that there's, there's real life circumstances that are taking place. People have financial things that they deal with. And then, they, and then they come up with plans on how to fix their financial situations. Or people are lonely. And they come up with plans to try to fix, you know what I'm saying, lo- their loneliness. And they, they, whatever the case. But what God, and, and, and you know, another thing that's sad, let me just say this. Another thing that's sad is a lot of times we don't, we don't even understand these things until we start to become a little more mature in the faith. So it's got to be truthful, it's kind of like, Almost, I don't want to say impossible, but it's more likely that a believer, especially if he's a new believer, is going to make decisions that are more flesh than they are faith. And sometimes the decisions that we make are longer-term situations than than some things that we do. Like if I buy a new car and I got a note that I can't really afford, that's one thing. But then there's even, I mean, it can be bad enough. You can mess up your credit. You know, then you want to get a house, and you can't get a house because you messed up your credit. You know, and now you got to keep living in this slumlord's apartment. I don't know. I'm just making up stuff. But, but, but I'm just trying to say, there's bigger decisions than that that have to be made. And, and, and many times, we're just kind of like forging forward with trying to, you know what I'm saying, doing it our, our own way is the main point I'm trying to make. So if you go to verses 9 through 11, we could, Romans chapter 9, verses 9 through 11. Um, For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. So I want you to see that, that, you know, this is the whole time. Look, if we went back in Genesis and we found this spot, this is when Abraham's like, oh, that you would bless Ishmael. And the Lord's saying, but the seed is in Isaac. And around this time, Sarah is going to be with child. And then you remember Sarah was listening behind the tent, busted out laughing. Yep. Like, how am I going to have a kid, man? Come on. I'm 90. Abraham's 99. We're past the years. The point is, is that God was going to do a supernatural work. God doesn't want man's hands involved in his work. Amen. He doesn't want it to be confusing. He wants us to know when it's him and he wants us to know when it's us. Abraham had already produced Ishmael. God said, no, I'm going to pr- produce something supernatural. Amen? And then it goes on to say in verse 10, Romans 9, 10, not only this, but also when Rebekah had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Okay, going into verse 11. So you remember, so Sarah was Abraham's wife. 
Rebekah was Isaac's wife. Isaac fathered Esau first, was the firstborn, and Jacob, so the set of twins. Y'all remember that story? That they were twins and they wrestled in her womb. You remember that? And, and, and that Jacob, they say when Esau came out, the Bible says Jacob had a hold of his heel. Because he was like, no, I want to be first. And it was a foreshadowing of how he was going to handle his business as his life went forward, right? So the children, not even being born yet, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, I want you to see that word right there because we're going to talk about that word election here in a moment, that might stand not of works, but of him that calls. So again, Jesus had said it before, no man comes unto the Father but by me. And he says, no man comes unto me unless the Father first calls him. So there has to be a calling that goes forth, and then the person that responds is the one that ends up being a true follower of God, a true Israelite according to faith, a true believer, amen. When they hear the calling, they respond. And that's really what makes you and I different if we're born again tonight than, say, like a person that doesn't know the Lord. The difference between you and I tonight is not because, oh, I'm saved and you're not. It's not because I know more about the Bible. It's not because I'm more spiritual. Yeah, it's because we're born again and the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us as opposed to other people that are out there they're not they, the spirit of god doesn't live in them and they're not serving the lord right so god's election for choosing the fruit of sarah's offspring was based on a supernatural birth that would foreshadow the birth of jesus so what i'm, I'm trying to back up just a second and i want to make a point we're talking about election now we're talking about true israel we're talking about who a believer is and who a believer is not. He uses Sarah as an example. Sarah is an example of a person that believed God according to the supernatural. Specifically, Sarah is a person that believed God according to a supernatural birth. God's plan involved a supernatural birth. So God's plan of election includes those that are willing to believe in a supernatural natural birth. Now, the second example is Esau. Because because it says that while the two were in her womb, the Bible says in if you go back to verse um well, let's go ahead and go to 12 because we're talking about Esau right now. Let's go ahead and read verses 12 and then we'll read 13. It was said unto her, talking about Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, Esau and Jacob, it was said unto her the elder, the firstborn will serve the younger. Okay, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. So, so the question is, is that if you've ever thought about the Bible before, it's like, well, God, leave. God, why do you want to hate someone before they've even done anything wrong? And there's even another scripture in the Bible that talks about that. For God hated Esau before, before they had even done anything. So why would God, first of all, why would God hate anybody to begin with? Secondly, why, because when we, what we learn about the life of Esau, and I mean, I've preached on this many a time, but the word Esau actually comes, is, is connected. You know, later on, they named the nation that, that Esau founded Edom. Okay, we talked about that Wednesday night. Edom is the same variant of the word Adam. Okay, you know what Adam means? Red. Because Adam came from the red clay of the earth. So the, word, the color red is interconnected to that which is earthly. The Bible says Esau came out all red and hairy. Esau was red. He was hairy. He, his name meant red. And he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a pot of red stew. So basically what the Bible is instructing us on Esau is that he was connected to this earth and that's what he was concerned about, the things of the earth. The Bible says that right here in verse, uh, in, in, well, in another scripture, it says that in actually in Genesis 25, 34, we don't have to turn there, but it says that Esau despised his birthright. God, in his foreknowledge, knew in advance that Esau was going to despise his birthright. God, in his foreknowledge, knew that Naya was going to accept Jesus and that it would have an impact on her other siblings. He knew that Mike would accept Jesus. He knew that Robert would accept Jesus. God, in his foreknowledge, knew 
everybody in this room that was going to accept Jesus. And he also knew those that wouldn't accept Jesus. Now, the Baptists take a hard line stance and they will say that's what election means. Some are going to receive Jesus. Some are going to reject Jesus. And so they call that, the, that's what they call the election. And that's what they call the concept of predestination. And so they'll say basically that God has already chosen in advance who's coming in and who's staying out. And I'm just saying, like, first of all, that don't even sound right, okay? I mean, if it is right, I want to know, but it doesn't sound right. Because if it doesn't, so, so then, and so many times what ends up happening is, oh, well, whoever, it's just God's will, God's will be done, God's sovereign, just let God do his thing. But no, he called you to take the seed of the gospel, amen, and to let the light of Christ shine out of you into other people's lives. And so, you know, now maybe, it, maybe we could still say this. Yeah, but that still doesn't mean that God hasn't already picked them pre in advance and that he doesn't, he doesn't let us know what it is he's doing and he just wants us to do our part. I'm, I'm all about that, but guess what? The, the election is not in the individual. See, so God can for, foreknow something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he predestinated it, meaning that he already in advance said, this is how it's going to be. Jacob will receive me. Esau will not. Therefore, I hate Jake, Esau. Instead, what it means is that God in his foreknowledge knew that Esau was going to despise his own birthright. You know what that describes? Listen to me. This describes a person who is of the earth. This describes a person who could care less about the things of God. This describes a person that has rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, they were given the opportunity. Esau represents all those that are of the world that refuse to come the way that God has provided. And instead, they're worried about their material possessions. And in Esau's case, I'm famished. My belly is growling. Give me some of that, give me some of that lentil stew and, and let, you can have my birthright. Who, can, who cares about the birthright? But you know what's interesting is, is that he sold the birthright, but then also Jacob wanted to bless him. But with the birthright, had a double portion of an inheritance. He didn't even care about that. Again, I want you to be reminded of the importance of the birthright because that was interconnected to the authority that was given to the family, which is a type of Jesus being given the authority from his father to be able to rule over. And in the nation of those early stages, the fathers, like Brendan said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Okay, that God in the early stages of this beautiful plan for salvation history was already calling on people to believe him by faith. So those that are going to be true Israelites are those that will believe in the plan of God, the supernatural plan of God. So the supernatural plan of God that allows an Israelite to become a true Israelite or a heathen to become a born again believer is contingent upon two things. Number one, a supernatural birth, amen, Jesus, and a willingness to embrace that, a willingness to come to God, amen? You have to be willing by faith, do the works of Abraham. What are the works of Abraham? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteous. What must we do to work the works of God? Believe on him whom he has sent. And that's the plan. That's the plan of God. Amen? So Jacob is a type of the spirit. Now listen, that doesn't mean Jacob did everything right. We know Jacob had a lot of failures in his personal life, but in the end, look, Jacob is the one that laid his head on that pillow of a rock at Bethel. And, and God spoke to him, and even though Jacob tried to take matters into his own hands on more than one occasion, when it's all said and done, Jacob served the Lord. He walked after God, amen, and God used him mightily. So, so Jacob is painted in the true light of true believers, far from perfect, because he, he contributed his shares of failures, but in the end, he was concerned about God's plan, amen. All right, so the election, again, proceeds like I already told you. God calls his people towards his supernatural plan. Man responds by faith. So that is really the election, my friend. It's not, I know I've, I've probably said it before, but people say, any, mini, miny, mo catch a sinner by the toe. It's not that. 
the plan of God, the election of God, is those that respond to God's plan through faith. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Let me say it again. Let me say this, and let me draw a little picture because maybe that will help. The plan of God, the election of God, is those that choose to believe God according to his plan. So let's, let's see like this. Let's see if it works like this. I don't know how to draw an earth too well. If I had a picture, I would show you, but let's just act like this is America, something like that. I know it don't look nothing like that. And then this is Mexico down here, South America, and I don't know, maybe... Who knows what's over there? But you get the point. This is the earth. Okay? You get the, you get the point? And look, on the earth, what we got? We got a whole bunch of people. Right? And then we got a plan. The plan of God. This is the crown of thorns. He broke the curse. Amen? From the ground will grow thorn and thistle. And so he got a crown of thorns on his head. He broke the curse. He died on the cross. And so now... So God would say, maybe in his mind, it would be something like this. This is the election. Okay? Does that make sense? In my foreknowledge, I know that I have a specific plan. Part, a big part of my plan is to create a nation out of one man named Abraham. Because I know, while they don't know it, I'm going to start telling them through the prophets that I'm going to send Messiah to the world. And he says it in some of the other Old Testaments that I'm going to call those people that were not my people, my people. And I will call those that were not my beloved, my beloved. And so God always had a plan that he was going to bring the Gentiles in. Okay, and now we can look backwards. You and I have the luxury in seeing this is how God did it. He did it through Jesus. And Jesus first went to the house of Israel. But Israel rejected. And so therefore God made the apostle Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. Amen. And so what I'm trying to say, though, is this. Is that God up here, he, he's calling. He's calling mankind on the earth. And so whenever, so God in his foreknowledge says, this is my election. Those that will believe, listen, in the Old Testament over, we could say that we could call this the Old Testament. In my election, it's still those that are going to believe me by faith according to my plan. God's plan has never changed. It just became more clear, clarity, if you will. The fuzziness is gone. You, you know, it's like you didn't have glasses and you couldn't see, but now you have glasses and so you're 20 20. Now you can see. And so in the Old Testament, though, the plan was the same. I'm going to send, I'm going to have a supernatural birth. I'm going to send Messiah. In the meantime, till he gets here, the law will be your tutor. You're going to offer up these animal sacrifices. You're going to shed their blood. And that's going to be, that, that's going to assuage my wrath upon the nation. For, uh, definitely on the day of atonement, you're going to offer up blood. You're going to put it on the mercy seat. That's going to cover the nation for one year. Okay, and you'll keep doing this perpetually as a reminder, just like you'll do every year for Passover. And you remember what he said? In, in, in Exodus, he said, listen, you're going to do this every year. And one day your children are going to say, Father, why do we do this? And he's going to say, you're going to tell your children when they ask that question because our God delivered us with his mighty hand out of Egyptian bondage. That's how. And, and so whether or not our children follow, I mean, I hope your children, I mean, I'm praying for your kids every day. I, I, well, definitely every day at service. I want you to know that. I, we specifically take time to pray for the young people. And I pray for my adult kids. Amen? That we would do our part, which is to, put, to sow the seed in their heart and to pray. Amen? And to believe God that they will serve him. Amen? And so, so the election says that this is how it's, there's, a, there's an elect portion of people that are going to believe me according to my plan. So I call them. How does he call in the New Testament? Through the gospel. Amen? How can they hear unless they ha if they don't have a preacher? Amen. And how beautiful are the feet of those that bring the gospel. You're not just talking about me, my friend, because my feet ain't that beautiful. But I will tell you this. He is talking about beautiful feet on people that are bring the gospel to a person that's lost. And that includes you. You got beautiful feet if you're telling people about Jesus. Because how will they know if they don't have a preacher? Amen. And then, and then, but, but then whenever we tell them, it gives them the opportunity to receive. And so then what they do is they go from being a heathen, amen, to the elect of God, right, in Christ. They, and so that's the election. I want you to see that. I hope that makes sense. The plan of God 
is what makes a person the election. Now, God can look in his foreknowledge and he can see if we called this person Jacob and we called that person Esau. And we could say this person's David. Okay. I'm just, I'm just using these Old Testament people. Well, Jacob was in. Esau was out. And God didn't make it happen. And he, he's going to get into it here in a second because that's what the next verse talks about. It says that he told Moses, I'll have mercy on who I want to have mercy on. And I'll harden who I want to harden. Okay. He actually says that in verse 15 of Romans chapter 9. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And many people have had a problem with God. You know, or like, I've been serving the Lord for a little while now. I've had a lot of conversations. Like, well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. I don't really remember. I'd have to go back and look, and maybe some of y'all know shooting from the hip, and that's fine. If you want to shout it out, that's fine. What came first, the chicken or the egg? What came first, God hardened Pharaoh's heart or Pharaoh hardened his own heart? Okay, either way, the point is, is that you're not going to sit. As a matter of fact, in, this, in a couple of verses, we get the answer. God don't want to have to harden nobody's heart, but he will. He, listen, he has even created the unrighteous for his own glory. God is going to reveal his own glory through judgment. God reveals his glory through both judgment, wrath, and mercy and grace. Mercy and grace for you, judgment and wrath for those that are like Esau that refuse to believe in the plan of God. The judgment of God is coming upon the earth. And it's going to be vicious. The, the age of grace is going to, the, the page will be turned, the chapter changed, and the age of grace will be behind us and then wrath will come. And thank God that you and I are not called to endure wrath. Jesus endured our spiritual wrath for us. Amen? Doesn't say that we're not called to endure tribulation. Now, I mean, I'm just going to tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said, Jesus said this. In this world, now, this, this, I'm not trying to say that Jesus said, oh, you're going to have to go through the tribulation. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm trying to make a point. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. John 16 and 33. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. So you're not promised that you're not going to experience tribulation. You're not. Yeah, and and you, your position may be, well, but I believe the scripture says that I will be saved from the, the great tribulation. Well, praise God. I hope we're all in that boat, my friend. But guess what? That's not what I see. And, and it would not surprise me if the church did not have to endure. I don't even know why I'm getting into this, but I just want to make a point. Because there is going to be a winnowing out, a separating from sheep and goats, from grain and chaff. Amen. And there's not a better way. And listen, I'm not saying this cocky. I can promise you that because, look, I understand. I'm full well of my own life. Okay. I, well, I mean, I say I'm as well aware of my life as what you could be of your life. Because, I mean, even the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? The Lord knows my heart obviously better than I do, but I know my heart well enough to know I, gotta, I need help. Amen? And I, and I would need help had, if I had to endure the time, any time in the Great Tribulation. I'd need help if I just got hungry for a week. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? Or maybe if I got hungry for about four months because I got a little bit of ration set aside. But that ain't going to last forever. And my point is if my stomach starts growling enough, or if I go through some things, even if it's not the great tribulation, if I'm going through any kind of tribulation, I need the Lord. You need the Lord. Amen? Paul needed the Lord. When Nero called him and said, bring him to the chopping block, cut that head off, Paul needed the Lord. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. See, I'm going to tell you right now, that ain't the message most preachers are preaching. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. You do what you want with me. But I'm trying to make a point. Not all preachers are preaching that message because most people don't want to hear that kind of message. No, preacher, I want you to tell me how I'm going to get my light bill paid. I want you to tell me. Well, you're going to quit overspending your money, number one. You're going to start showing up to work on time. I'm preaching to the preacher. You're going to start, you're going to be productive when you're on the job. You're going to work for the man like you're working for the man. 
And if you get all your business squared away and do your stuff right, live within your means, don't be hating on some dude that's driving a black Tesla or a pearl white Jaguar because you don't know. I mean, the dude might be in debt, but that's his problem, but he might not be. He might be able to afford that car he's driving. Live within your means, right? And give your, if you're a child of God, give God what's due to God. I don't hardly ever preach about giving money, but come on, man. That I'm not telling you something that is not in the word of God. Give God what belongs to God. God said in the book of Malachi, you robbed me. Well, how did we rob you, Lord? In your tithes and your offerings. You're robbing me. Test me in this, the Lord would say, and see that I will not open up a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not even able to contain. Tithing and offerings are a faith walk, my friend. And the question is, do you believe, I'm talking about myself now, I can tell you right now, I know it works. Yeah, right. You think, I, sometimes I've even thought, you know, I have a little bit more money and pad in my pocket if I just kind of hold on to some of that stuff myself. Yeah. Don't work like that. The Lord put holes in your pocket. Yes, yes, you leave a trail of money behind you. <laughs> yes. Amen. Amen. And then once we finally get, I'm just telling you, it's a big part of revelation right there because this is in the word of God too. Once we have, once we become humble enough to start giving the Lord what belongs to him, because really, I know I've said this before, but I've gotten to revelate, it all belongs to him. The breath in my lungs. Do you believe that tonight? And I don't really care who likes that. I mean, I'm not talking to you, maybe somebody watching on video. I'm just saying, I don't really care who likes that or not. It don't belong to you. And, and listen, don't talk to me about working hard. Don't talk to me about putting in hours. I understand. And it, we need a spiritual breakthrough to be able to give from a heart that is, wants to be giving. Amen? And, and, and yet at the same time, if we will do that, God, pro I promise you, God will bless you. It may not be like what the Word of Faith preacher talks about. Sow your $1,000 seed and reap your 1,000% harvest or whatever. And we got still got people waiting to get a million-dollar check in the mailbox. It ain't coming, dude. That's greed. I'm not saying nobody's ever going to get a million-dollar check, but the person that's getting rich is the, the preacher with the jet, okay, on that deal. Anyway, let me move on. What is what's my point? I don't even remember. It's a super, I know it's this, though. It's a supernatural plan, and that's the election, the plan of God. Huh? If you yes, thank you, brother. That's good. Let let Gowdy preach it real quick. You need a microphone, brother. <laughs> if you're sanctified, you will tithe. If you're being sanctified, you will tithe. Amen. What does tithing even mean? It's a tenth. Boy, I didn't plan on talking about this. This is not in my notes. Somebody needs to hear it though. You know, and listen, let me just say this about that. You, while I'm going to tell you what the Bible says, it's still, I'm not over here preaching this in such a way to demand that you pay your tithes. That'd be the most ridiculous thing ever known to man. Although, I have told y'all stories before about how one dude that I know said that the preacher knocked on his door one day and wanted to see his W-2 form. You will not have to worry about me doing that. That's somebody in town. I will not knock on your door to see your W-2 form because it ain't, frankly, it's none of my business. And to be perfectly honest with you, I got enough things to deal with on my own that I don't need to know whether or not you being faithful and you're giving to the Lord. That's between you and Jesus. But you will find out your own way, one way or another. Now, now at the same time, is it possible that you could have somebody in the church that doesn't have the revelation to pay tithes, but yet at the same time, they're really good with their money and things like that, and that they, they, don't, ha they don't have holes in their pocket. Look, anything's possible. But sometimes, sometimes giving money to the kingdom is not all about a financial blessing. I think it was Naya and I talking about a week ago. And we were, I was sharing with her, you know, whenever I got the inheritance from my dad. <laughs> now, you could say, well, it doesn't look like you got an inheritance. Okay, but well, that's because I didn't spend the other 90%, right? Okay, but I was struggling with this chunk of money. Like, ah, this ain't really like earning. I don't really have to pay a tithe on this. This is, this is more like something that my daddy gave me through an inheritance. So anyway, long story short, 
I went back and forth, went back and forth, and then finally I just said, you know what, I'm really getting blessed through Sun Life Radio. I, I'm just going to go ahead and bite the bullet, and I'm going to stroke this check. So I wrote a $16,000 check, and I sent it in. I didn't even get one of the books that I ordered, but <laughs> that's okay. It was, it, it, but So I sent in the check, and I'm telling you, I was telling Naya the next day, I'm not trying to tell you that you can buy spiritual wisdom. You can't. I'm not trying to tell you that you can buy favor from God. No, you can't. I'm not trying to tell you that if you send a $16,000 check, you're going to get a 100% return and you're going to end up with 1.6. That's not what I'm trying to say because that wouldn't be true. But what I am trying to tell you is, is that after I sent that check, and now I didn't stop. That's the, look, the first check, big check I ever wrote was $1,000. And I actually wrote it to a false prophet, not knowing, but guess what? The Lord prepared me when I wrote that check. Like, I felt like I needed to write that first $1,000 check. And then after that, you can ask Danielle, we, we've written a few. You know, she, <laughs> she's always trying to temper me down a little bit. Man, I haven't written one like that in a while, but if I feel led by the Lord, I'm going to write it. I have seen God move in my life. Anyway, I wrote that big check, and it was hard to let that one go. And, but yet at the same time, the next day, I'm telling you, my mind started and my heart started to become flooded with spiritual revelation. Spiritual, look, I was early on in the message of the cross, and I'm telling you, I like, I was drawing all these pictures of the, I mean, yeah, I got some of the stick man stuff, obviously, from Brother Lauren, but I was tweaking it, I was changing it, I was asking, now, hey, put this on a, on a slide projector for me, and all this other kind of stuff. I, I just, my understanding of the Word of God, it just, it just exponential. Yeah. So all I'm trying to say is this, is that being faithful to the Lord, you don't even know what the blessing is going to look like, but I promise you, he will bless you. And sometimes, look, if you know that the, that the tithe is a tenth, and he's like, I can't afford that. Well, guess what? Just give what you can give and keep trusting God that one day I'll be able to give you the whole thing. Amen? Amen. But just test him in this. That's the one thing that the Lord said you can test me. God was not happy with the children of Israel in the wilderness. They put me to the test, and they provoked me. He wasn't happy with that. But he, he gives you the offer to test him in your giving to see whether or not he will turn around and bless you. Amen? I just want to encourage you, man. I believe it works. It's the best, it's the best retirement plan <laughs> known to man. Amen? I believe that. Praise. Huh? A wit- thank you. A witness to your faith. Amen. 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 And look. I'm not trying to build up a man, but I done sat in Mexico at the, in the lobby of the hotel, and I'm tired because Gowdy done drug me all over the streets of Tampico, and we're going to catch a plane early in the morning, and that was probably the day I got Montezuma's revenge, but it wasn't, I wasn't sick yet. And Gowdy's like, you got to come down, and you got to listen to this meeting, Matt. And I'm like, dude, I don't even understand what y'all are saying. I'm so done. I've been trying to learn Spanish since the day we got off the plane. My brain is fried. Uh, you know, I'm tired, dude. And he's like, no, I need you to come. So I sit down at the table with him and Pastor Ramon, and he's like, I need you to see this, Matt. We got a document this. Check after check. I'm not doing this for you, Gaudi. I'm doing this for the Lord. Check after check after check after check. Tens of thousands of dollars out of Gaudi's personal money sent to Mexico. Why do you think I'll push what this brother's doing? Because I have seen it with my own eyes. Funding the work in Mexico out of his own pocket. As a welder, as a supervisor, whatever he's doing, sending all of his money back. I mean, I'm not saying all of it. He paid, I'm sure he takes care of his family here. But my point is, is that it was a lot of money. Okay. And, and, and you know what? God's doing a great work over there. Faith. It's a way to exhibit your faith. Amen. Just like coming to church. Every, whenever the doors are open, it's a way to exhibit your faith. Praying to God is a way to exhibit your faith. Giving to God is a way to exhibit your faith. Amen? Yes. Praise God. All right. So he said, he said, I will have mercy on whom I choose to have mercy, and I will, and I will harden. You know, he said that, whom, whom I choose to harden. Amen? Let's look at, uh, let's, can you go to verse 16? Uh, so then it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. Now look, look at verse 17. For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Pray, you know, so he's saying, like, I'm, and you know, the Bible teaches us that. 
that God causes one to rise and causes another to fall. Whenever, whenever we see, even you could say like some people might feel like, oh, that election was stolen. Okay, guess what? God still allowed it to happen. If it did happen that way, you know, it, God still allowed it to happen. As a matter of fact, sometimes we wonder, the Bible says that the people rejoice when the, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Are you, am I trying to say that Joe Biden, God allowed Joe Biden to take the presidency to curse the people? curse the, the country because no that's not what I'm trying to say but what I am trying to say is this is that God allows things to happen for a purpose could it be that we're nearing the end I mean anything's possible it seems kind of like that way to me that we're nearing the end and that these are all pieces of the puzzle that are coming together to allow various laws to come into place to allow various things right but basically when it's all said and done God says I might raise raise you up just so that I can tear you down, so that I can show my glory. And like I told you before we started this little thread, God is going to show his glory through judgment and through wrath, just as he has shown his glory in your life through grace and mercy. Amen? So in verses 15 through 18, God said to Moses, he'll have mercy on whom he wants. He'll harden whom he wants. Amen? And, uh, and let's go to verse 22 real quick. Now, this is the, one of the parts that I wanted you to see was this word long-suffering right here. What if God, because you see people would say, well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's not fair. Look at what it says. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? So what if? Yes, God allowed Pharaoh to be risen up for the purpose to show his glory by tearing him down. But what if before God did that, he endured with great long-suffering. Not, as a matter of fact, I don't even know if there's a what if here. How many times did God send Moses to go talk to Pharaoh? Let my people go. Let him go, Pharaoh. And then I'm going to show you what's going to happen if you refuse. And I know some of those, there's the going back and forth, Pharaoh hardens his heart. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. But the point is, is that God was, is long-suffering. He has patience with people in his relationships. He doesn't just destroy someone. Aren't you glad that God's been long-suffering with you? Amen. Now, don't you think that as a believer that we should be able to let go of our little bitterness towards other people? No, I mean, really. I mean, how many Christians do you think live in a prison because they, they, they have bitterness and, and anger to war? Yeah, because they can't forgive. Well, how are you going to be forgiven if you can't forgive somebody? Right? All right. So verse 23, actually, you can go to uh, verse 24. Even us whom he has called, not only of the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. And then in 25, as he also in Osi, which is a King James way to say Hosea, I will call them, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. Verse 27, Isaiah also cries concerning Israel, the number through the number of the children of Israel be as the, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. See, he's still like, the main thought still has to do with all that calls itself Israel is not Israel. Those people that were not my people, I said they were going to be my people. Those people that were not my beloved, I said they were going to be my beloved. How you got to believe, like the belief of Abraham. What did Abraham believe? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So this is the plan of God. For he, verse, uh, and then in verse 29, it says, and Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. So basically the Apostle Paul is saying, we think so highly of ourselves as the people of God, yet we rejected Messiah whom he sent. And if we're really honest with one another, had the Lord not been merciful to us, we would have all been wiped out just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And then I'm going to just kind of close with this. 
the last three verses. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness. Like talking about in the Old Testament, those Gentile nations that didn't know God. They served pagan gods, right? That's how we started this lesson tonight. That, that at Babel, they served pagan gods. And then they were split up and they continued to serve pagan gods. Even though Israel was in the land, they continued to serve pagan gods. And, and he's saying... What shall we say then that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, they didn't know nothing about righteousness except for whatever Israel was trying to tell them, and then Israel wasn't even living for the Lord. Yet they have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. What are you talking about, Paul? Because when the time came for Messiah to come and the gospel was preached, when they heard the gospel, they believed in Jesus, and now they become the sonship of God. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why not, Paul? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. I wish I really had time to talk to you about the stumbling stone, but there's so many verses in the Bible that, number one, the Bible says that Jesus would become the chief cornerstone. I've explained before they didn't have cement to pour back in those days, and so what they would do is they would start a foundation with a cornerstone. Basically, what, what, what's being said here is that Jesus was the cornerstone of the foundation upon which God was going to build the house. Amen. But yet, for those that refused to believe, they stumbled. It became a stumbling stone. Instead of a cornerstone of faith, it became a stumbling stone, and they fell upon it, and it, and it broke them. And look, I'm just going to real quick, I can read to you um, this particular scripture out of 1 Peter 2, 4 through 9. I mean, if you, you can put it up if you want. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 9. I'm going to read this, and then we'll close. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed, indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. He's talking about you. He's talking about believers. A living, a living, Jesus is a living stone. Okay, but you also, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is a living stone. You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. By Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the cornerstone. He's building a house. This is kind of like the idea, if you could think of the tabernacle or the temple where the presence of God dwells. And he's using the concept of lively living stones in the body of Christ all coming together and the illustration of a house and within which the church or the body, the Spirit of God lives. Amen? Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believes on him shall not be confounded or confused. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. So, so the very b builders or the leaders of Israel rejected. When God finally sent Jesus, he promised them he was coming, but when he finally sent him, they rejected the cornerstone. And it became a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Those that reject the gospel were appointed unto this wrath. But you, he's talking about you now, church, the church, the living, lively stones being built, right? He says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Are you not excited, amen, tonight that God called you out of darkness, amen, and into the marvelous light? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word that tells us about your precious son. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us, Lord God, to stay focused on you and not this crazy world around us. And help us, Lord, to be used by you to share the light of Jesus with this lost and darkened world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.